Um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this webinar from Decker Chambers, um, today brought jointly with Waitmans. Um, I'm joined in Chambers here in London by Laura Johnson, KC. I'm Andrew Warnock, KC. And joining us from Waitmans in Manchester are Paul Tarn and Roseanne McNeil. Today we're going to be talking about the recommendations, or key recommendations of the Manchester Arena Inquiry to date. And we've said to date because there have been two reports produced so far by the Inquiry Chairman. The first report dealt with security at the arena, and the second report published at the beginning of this month dealt with the emergency service response. There is a third report to come, which will deal with the security services and counterterrorism police and whether they could and should have prevented the attack. Um, if at any time during the webinar, anybody has a question, feel free to pop it onto the chat. And if it's really difficult, I'll hand it over to Laura, Paula, Rose to answer it. Um, in terms of how we are going to um, approach this, Laura is going to talk about the emergency response at the arena, what went wrong. Um, what recommendations arose or are, arise out of it from the report and connected to that practical tips to drive good practice for those involved in providing an emergency response. I will speak about the care gap, which was identified by the inquiry. What is it and what should be done about it? And Paul and Rose will talk about the protect duty, you may have heard a lot about that in the news recently, what is it, uh, where are we now, and what are its potential regulatory and uh, liability implications. So I'll hand over to Laura, first of all, to talk about the emergency response. Thank you, Angie. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, Volume two was handed down on the 3rd of November 2022, so very recently, and Andrew said it was concerned with the emergency response to the attack. Uh, it runs to over 900 pages across two volumes and provides a detailed analysis of what happened during the response, what went wrong, the preparedness of the various agencies for, for responding to a mass casualty event, and the response of each agency individually, and then makes recommendations for the future. In the 10 minutes or so I have, my ability to get across those 900 pages is going to be relatively limited. Um, but what I propose to do is provide some headline summaries of this part of the report and then some reflections um, that I hope are relevant to future practice. So starting with this slide, the emergency response, what were Sir John Saunders' conclusions about it? Uh, the headline is that it fell far below the standard that it should have been. The detail of, of why that happened um, is, is covered, as I say, very carefully in the report. Uh, we've drawn out of it some headline points. Uh, inadequate leadership by the police, who were the lead agency for the purposes of the response. Lack of communication between responders, both within their own agencies and also across different agencies. Failures to identify and share critical information, both within control rooms and within responders. Failures by the agencies to co-locate. Delays in deploying ambulances and ambulance personnel, and a failure by the fire and rescue service to arrive at the scene for over two hours. In terms of why those problems occurred, um, in broad headline points, Sir John Saunders found uh, a number of failures. Firstly, in some agencies, failures to adequately prepare. Failures to keep important plans up to date, failures to embed JESSIP, that's the joint working training. Failures to involve control rooms in training exercises, to adequately de debrief and learn from training exercises. 
and failures to take action on known problems. Uh, in particular, in the case of the police force, the known risk that the police force duty officer would be overwhelmed during an event of this sort, and a failure to have established a multi-agency control and talk group, which would have enabled all of the emergency responding agencies to communicate with each other easily and in real time. The report also covers the issue of event medical provision. It was a licensing requirement of the Manchester Arena that there be adequate healthcare services provided on site, and these were contracted by a private provider by the event organiser. So John Saunders concluded that the, um, although there was some risk assessment done, it was there was an inadequate risk assessment of the requirements of the Ari Ariana Grande concert uh, that was being uh, held that night. There was inadequately trained leadership and staff in the healthcare service provider and inadequate provision of equipment at the venue. Uh, and he said in terms, neither the arena operator nor healthcare provider took an adequate approach to considering how the healthcare service would respond to a mass casualty incident. And of course, um, that issue is very important to the question of the care gap, which Andrew is going to talk about later in this webinar. The recommendations come in the second part of the volume two report, and they come um, after a section that sets out some powerful conclusions. Although both individual and organisational failures were identified by Sir John Saunders for obvious reasons, important reasons, the focus of the recommendations are on the organisations involved and not on individuals. As I say, the backdrop to those recommendations is summarised um, in, the, in the short but powerful conclusions, which identify some of these points. That previous tragedies had not resulted in necessary change being implemented by the emergency services that the services had plans drawn up with good intentions, but they were not known by, uh, known about by everybody who should have known about them, that many non-specialists had little knowledge of the plans that had been devised, that some plans were not as clear as they should have been and others were poorly understood, that it was necessary for commanders to check that their subordinates had done what they should have been doing on the night, and if this had happened on the night, then some serious omissions may have been identified that the response wasn't properly coordinated, there was an absence of pooling of information. And Sir John Saunders acknowledged in his report that he had considered during the course of the hearings whether the joint working principles of Jessup should have been abandoned altogether, but he accepted that the real issue was to ensure that Jessup worked in practice, not just in theory. The communication and co-location were key to the success of Jessup, as were proper debriefing processes from previous incidents and training. Um, 149 recommendations are made. They're put in a very convenient series of tables towards the back of volume of the second part of volume two. And as many of them apply to sort of specific requirements of local agencies, uh, it's not particularly helpful for me to go through them in detail here. But many of the changes recommended have already been implemented by the local blue light agencies and additional recommendations have been made directed towards them. There are also recommendations made at resilience forum level and at national level, and all of them are important. For those of you who are working and advising in this area, there really is no substitute for familiarising yourselves with them. A number of the recommendations have been made that have been made are to be monitored um, with the agencies to file evidence about that uh, to show the progress that is being made. But the inquiry identified that even with a textbook blue light response, delays in getting treatment to the seriously injured are likely to occur. And Andrew's going to talk about the recommendations that address the care gap. In terms, however, of practical tips, um, the overarching point uh, that I think comes very clearly through the arena inquiry and, its re and the report into the emergency response is that systems should not fail because of individual errors. And what I've tried to do is draw out of those recommendations the issues that agencies need to be thinking about. And they are very familiar. None of this is reinventing the wheel. It's making sure that there is proper oversight across the agencies and joined up thinking about what they're doing. It's about planning and preparation, not just having plans filed somewhere, but having plans that are clear, that are known about by all potential responders, 
in particular those who are not specialists that may be the first to arrive on scene and, they, and that they are properly understood and that people know where to find them. It's about training which must be clear and consistent and capable of embedding learning and not just a tick box exercise and that training should be given to everyone who may find themselves responding to a mass casualty incident. Again, not just those with specialist knowledge, equipment or skills. It's about exercising, learning and embedding that those exercises need to be well thought out. They need to be clear in their objectives. They need to involve control rooms. They need to be properly debriefed and the issues that are identified by that debrief process need to be shared, thought about, learned from and embedded uh, in agencies as a result. It's about command, ensuring that all commanders who might be the individual that has to respond on the night are properly trained, that they're aware of their responsibilities, not only within their own service, but also for joint working. It's about who, what, where and how. So potential responders need to know what information exists. Are there site plans, action cards that should be followed, where they should find it? where in practical terms they should be responding to and who it is that they should be speaking to both within their own agency and also within other agencies. It's about communication, which was a key theme that ran throughout the Manchester Arena Inquiry. It's about having simple methods of communication that enable people to share what they know so that what they know can be used by other agencies to inform their response. And it's about understanding how to identify important information and if, if, if responders aren't obtaining the information they expect to be hearing, to train them in critical questioning so that they know what they should be asking to get that important information out of both their control rooms and also out of other responders. And it's also about record keeping. Um, one of the issues that runs as a thread through some of the recommendations is making sure that proper records are kept on the night, either by some form of um, physical record keeping on a computer or on pads or through body worn cameras. None of these will be of a surprise to anybody who works in this area, um, but these are the issues that agencies need to be looking at to make sure that they're properly prepared to respond in the future. I'm now going to hand over to Andrew, who's going to talk about the care gap. Um, one of the major um, things identified by the inquiry was this care gap. Uh, what is it? Well, in a mass casualty incident, it is, it seems inevitable that there will be a delay in paramedics and or other healthcare staff arriving at the scene and commencing treatment. And that period of delay is the care gap. Why is there a care gap? Well, the inquiry identified four reasons for that. Firstly, there is the reality of ambulance resourcing, and we'll all have seen the pictures on TV, on the news, of backed up ambulances outside hospitals. The reality is there is not a lot of spare capacity in the ambulance system, and as Sir John Saunders put it, ambulances are always playing catch up. Then, when you do get an ambulance to the scene, there's the time required to establish command and control. It is well established practice that the first paramedics on the scene should not start treating patients, but should set up and establish command and control. And that will involve them assessing the scene, passing back what's called a methane message to their own control room and all their agencies, setting out um, details about the situation as they have found it and assessed it, including what resources um, are, are required. Then, once that's done, there will usually, in a mass casualty event, be a requirement for triage, because demand and need for treatment will usually exceed capacity. And so it's important that those who are most seriously and life-threateningly injured are quickly identified to prioritise them for treatment. And finally, and this is particularly true in the terrorism attack, but it may be true in other incidents too, there's the impact of zoning for danger. There may be areas where, because of the level of dangerousness that they're assessed at, um, it may take more time for casualties to be treated. And so the inquiry looked at two 
um, particular broad issues relating to the care gap. The first was how to narrow it. Um, the second was how to fill it. Um, well, narrowing the care gap, the first solution may be thought rather obvious, but obviously comes at um, potentially a cost. And the chairman recommended that ambulance trusts need to review the resources they have available and whether they are sufficient. Um, there are also specialist ambulance teams called hazardous area response teams whose members have special training to go into areas which are particularly hazardous. The, in the inquiry heard, however, that there were sometimes problems with these um, partly caused by the pressures on the ambulance service in that in terms of their numbers, there may not be um, enough people trained um, for the role. But also, even where teams um, are trained, they're quite often, because of the demand on the service, deployed to other events which wouldn't necessarily require their skills and so are not available for immediate deployment in the case of a mass casualty event. The inquiry has recommended that all of those matters be looked at and reviewed by those responsible for ambulance trusts and the health service. Um, the inquiry also identified the need, and it picks up on the points Laura was making, for better working together by uh, particularly the command structure of leadership um, at a mass casualty event. And it was some of the recommendations which Sir John has made for review for those responsible for joint operating between the services is that they consider um, writing into policies that there ought to be a presumption of leadership by the most appropriate emergency service for the event uh, because there was a concern that sometimes what happens is the agencies revert um, to their own um, siloed way of thinking or running and they may have different appetites for risk um, a presumption of leadership by the most appropriate agency, for instance, in a terrorist attack, that would be the police, um, that might obviate some of that. Um, he also recommends that there should be a presumption of forward deployment. In other words, that help will be got to casualties, unless, of course, there are good evidence-based reasons why it can't be got there. And common to all that is development of a common risk appetite between the emergency services, because each service, um, the chairman thought at present, um, there was a risk that each service would have a different appetite for risk. Um, and indeed, there may be different appetites for risk among individual commanders. And linked to that, the inquiry recommends that there should be what he was described as high fidelity training um, on working in emergency situations. And that would include involvement in, in um, exercises uh, which simulate real life. Um, the inquiry also considered in the practices in various countries around the world. Um, what one model um, which the report spends some time on is the French model, and the French have something called RAID teams. And a RAID stands for Research, Assistance, Intervention, and Dissuasion, which is Search, Assistance, Intervention, and Deterrence in English. And basically, they're anti terror te police teams in France, which have doctors actually embedded in them. And those doctors are specially trained to operate even in areas um, where there may be, um, which would be classified as a hot zone or particularly um, dangerous um, and providing care essentially even under fire. Um, the inquiry heard that there are difficulties in translating that model and translating it into the UK structure of policing um, 
in the UK, we have a very well established system in the England of armed response vehicles. Um, there's also an issue about the timing of the secondary response um, that's required to get counterterrorism specialist officers into an incident. And very importantly, there's a question about the availability of medical personnel to perform a role. However, Mr. John clearly thought the, the model is worth looking at a little more closely and has made a recommendation that the counterterrorism police headquarters um, should consider the issue further. The other way in which care gap can be narrowed is by getting treatment through air ambulances. Um, but you may or may not be aware that in England, air ambulances are actually largely charities and not formally part of the health service. The advantage that they bring is that they are consultant led with consultants in emergency medicine, and they are able to bring um, to provide first responder interventions, also what are called bridging interventions between first responding and getting somebody um, enhanced care, and they can even provide enhanced care interventions. And Sir John has recommended the healthcare bodies should consider how better use might be made of air ambulances and how they might be integrated into the emergency response to a terrorist attack. Um, also to be considered is a new system of triage, which is, has been trialed and that I, I don't think I need to go into the technical details of that today, but it, it basically enables an, a quick 10 second triage for mass, mass casualty incidents. And so John recommends that be reviewed by all representative bodies of the emergency services with a view to being capable of being used by all of the emergency services. Uh, and then in relation to treatments, um, Sir John has recommended there's a review of the use of analgesia. At present, um, not much is given to people on the scene outside hospitals, um, but he recommends consideration be given to the changing regulation to allow the use of fentanyl lo lozenges. Fentanyl is a, an opi opioid. Um, the military are already using it. Sir John recommends that it be considered for use in civilian disaster contexts. Also, he recommended that hazardous area response teams should carry, for, uh, or there should be consideration as to whether they should carry freeze dried plasma. Um, he was satisfied in the evidence he heard that there were good reasons why they should not carry um, uh, full blood products. And finally, um, TXA, which is a blood clot clotting agent, which he again recommended should be carried on all frontline ambulances. The care gap is also to some extent going to have to be filled by the voluntary sector. And Sir John draws attention to this excellent organization, Citizen Aid, founded by um, Brigadier Hodgett, um, who has since been made the surgeon um, general for the um, for the army, yeah. and it provides um, training and, and very simple step training to members of the public, um, which can be found through the website, which empowers members of the public to save lives in the critical minutes before the emergency services are able to attend. Uh, for instance, training on how to apply a tourniquet. Uh, in, and then Sir John identifies there is a, a role for the wider public in other ways. Um, firstly, he recommends that the national curriculum first aid training, which is part of the national curriculum, curriculum at present, should be extended to cover catastrophic bleeds and airway impairment. So that would be education in schools. He also recommends a public education program to highlight how members of the public um, could help in an emergency. He is not, it should be said, 
intending to detract from the general advice which is given to members of the public, which is to run hide and tell if under attack, but recognises that some members of the public will not do that. Um, they will, as happened in the arena, stay and do their best to help. And for those who do, it is best that they are educated as much as they can be in how to provide immediate life-saving interventions. He also recommends a new duty of employers be considered in order to require them to train employees or certain categories of employees in this type of first aid intervention. And he also recommend, makes recommendations in relation to having publicly accessible trauma kits um, at key locations. Uh, if, additionally, Sir John recommends that all uh, event staff licensed by the Security Industry Authority should have first responder training. And he recommends that the regulation of healthcare services at events should be capable of enforcement by a regulator uh, with potential criminal consequences for breaches uh, by the providers of such services. In the meantime, he says there should be an interim review of licensing conditions to see if conditions need to be added in any cases um, to require a greater first aid provision. And he also recommends that for events over a certain size to be determined by those who review um, this, there should be an uh, ambulance liaison officer present. That would be somebody from the ambulance service, probably funded by the event provider, who could immediately liaise with the ambulance service in the event of a major incident. That those are all recommendations for the future, but be aware um, that the health and safety first aid regulations already require employers to provide adequate and appropriate facilities and personnel to ensure that their employees receive immediate attention if they are injured or taken ill at work. And although the, those regulations do not place a statutory duty on employers to make first aid provision for non-employees. The Health and Safety Executive strongly recommends that non-employees, i.e. members of the public, are included in an assessment of first aid needs. And of course, as lawyers will be familiar with this, that where a common law duty exists to take reasonable care to protect members of the public, whether that duty arises in tort or contract, the standard of care may be informed by the content of guidance such as that produced by the health and safety executive. In other words, it would not be safe for people to sit back running events, to sit back and think that until such time as there's further regulation, they don't need to do anything about it. Um, oh, sorry, I've jumped ahead. Whoa. Sorry, just jumping ahead to Paul and um, okay. go Right. You'll be pleased to see that I'm nearing the end of mine. Um, various recommendations were made for the emergency services, um, also in end of filling the care gap, including training of control room operators to advise members of the public on first responder interventions. Um, so that if somebody phones up for help, they can be told how to, for instance, apply a tourniquet or stem major bleeding. Um, all unarmed police officers and police community support officers to be trained in first aid and all firefighters 
to be trained in first responder interventions. And the chairman also highlighted um, that firearms officers, armed officers, have an important role to play because they, of course, are trained to provide emergency, emergency life saving aid to their colleagues if shot, or indeed to people that they themselves have shot. Um, and he considered that there was scope for making clear and widening the responsibilities of such officers um, to assist where they can in an incident such as that which occurred at the arena. I'm now going to hand over to Paul and Rose to talk about the protect duty. Thanks, Andrew. Um, we've agreed that Andrew's going to operate the slideshow in the style of uh, Chris Whitty. Um, so, Andrew, I'll, I'll let you know when we move on to our next slide. Um, Andrew and Laura have obviously covered in detail the recommendations arising from the Volume 2 report, which addresses the response of the emergency services. But perhaps the most significant development in this inquiry thus far, and one which is likely to have the widest application overall, comes in the first report of Sir John Saunders, which, which was released on the 17th of June last year, um, and I'm referring, of course, to the PROTECT duty. PROTECT is the product of the inspirational, tireless work of Fegan Murray, whose son Martin Hett was tragically killed in the arena attack. Uh, and of course, PROTECT is better known as Martin's Law. PROTECT itself is actually an existing strand of the government's counter-terrorism strategy, which is known as CONTEST. The other strands of the strategy are PREVENT, PURSUE and PREPARE. What's proposed by Martin's Law, which is endorsed within the Volume 1 report, is the creation of an entirely new duty which brings about the reform of PROTECT in its current guise. So under the proposal, what will happen is that the owners and occupiers of publicly accessible locations will need to positively assess the risk of terror attacks and take steps to reduce the threat and impact of such attacks in the future. The duty is expressed in terms of one of reasonable practicability. I think that's a concept which this audience are likely to be very familiar with. I can have the next slide, please, Andrew. So where are we up to in terms of PROTECT and what's happened so far? Well, the government launched a formal consultation in relation to PROTECT on the 26th of February last year. And Sir John Saunders, of course, delivered his report in June. Uh, and that was followed by the end of the consultation on the 2nd of July 2021. Um, it was sometime later on the 10th of January this year that the government response to the consultation was published. And it's fair to say that it was a positive response to the consultation. There were some 2,755 replies to the consultation, over 80 engagement events. And the government tells us that 70% of respondents are in favour of the creation of a protect duty. Now, there were some queries around PROTECT, particularly around the financial implications of imposing a duty and some uncertainty around how it would be enforced in the future. Now, May this year, PROTECT was featured in the Queen's speech, uh, but thereafter, progress seems to have stalled. And it was our expectation that we would likely have seen draft legislation before Parliament by now. Um, indeed, the language of the Home Office given during evidence in the inquiry was very much get ready. This is coming. Uh, it was advanced and imminent, um, but it's perhaps unsurprising that we haven't seen legislation before Parliament, given the um, chaos in government that we've seen earlier in the year. Nevertheless, when Sir John Saunders handed down his Volume 2 report on the 3rd of November, he utilised that as an opportunity to implore government to make further progress on PROTECT. His words were rather telling as well as to what the holdup might be, because he said there could be no excuse for not introducing a PROTECT duty for large organisations like the Manchester Arena, perhaps inferring that any delay in government really relates to concern about how to treat smaller organisations within the PROTECT duty. Pressure continues to build on the Home Secretary to move forward with the duty. The voices of the bereaved families are powerful. They've received encouragement from the <coughs> Chief Constables of various police forces. And of course, former Home Secretaries as well have all lent their support for rapid progress PROTECT to be implemented. And I think it's important as well that we recognise that PROTECT has got broad cross-party political support and wide support across local government. So we expect that that, that pressure will result in some progress soon um, with perhaps legislation going before Parliament in the new year. 
So before we look at how the duty will operate, it's worth us considering the issues identified in the volume one reports as they relate to the Manchester arena. Thanks, Paul. Can we have the next slide, please, Andrew? Thank you. So the volume one report addressed the security arrangements at the arena, and we think that the findings of the chairman um, really emphasise how important the protect duty is. And in particular, the chairman concluded that there were a number of missed opportunities for the bomber to have been spotted. And it's possible that that may have reduced the harm caused by the explosion. Now, the following isn't an exhaustive list, but we do think that they highlight some of the really key points for learning. So the first point is that of risk assessments. And the report really highlights the importance of carrying out a risk assessment which adequately addresses the threat of terrorism, particularly in light of the national threat level of the time. And in this case, the chairman found there was a missed opportunity to identify deficiencies in security arrangements. In this case, that was the CCTV blind spots and problems with security patrols. One of the um, unusual features of this case is the area where the explosion occurred. So for those of you who don't know, the city room is a large indoor space just outside of the Manchester arena. And it also sits inside a train station complex. And what that meant was that there were a number of parties that had some responsibility for it. And what the inquiry highlights is that um, for areas that are shared by multiple parties, it's really important to communicate with one another and be really clear about um, who is discharging any duties. Another feature which the inquiry heard a lot of evidence about was hostile reconnaissance. And that term uh, effectively describes terrorists gathering information prior to an attack, in particular looking at any weaknesses in an organisation's security arrangements. And it's clear from the um, evidence of the inquiry that Salman Abedi did this prior to the attack and had visited the city room on a number of occasions. And it's clear that duty holders will really have to think about um, hostile reconnaissance, how it's monitored and how any reports of suspicious behaviour are shared in the organisation. But that, of course, um, requires training for staff, which uh, leads me on to the next point. Now, the evidence of the inquiry was that there were missed opportunities for staff to have identified the bomber as suspicious. And that really um, brings home how important it is to ensure that staff are appropriately trained. And our expectation is that any organisation that might be at risk of a terrorist attack should ensure that all of its staff have some level of counterterrorism training. For larger organisations, it's likely they'll need a higher degree of training and possibly even licensed security operatives. And the final key point um, is that the chairman had identified issues with previous counter-terror regimes. And that's partly because they're much more limited in scope than what is proposed by PROTECT, and also because they're voluntary. And I think that's a really key point when we look at compliance and enforcement, which we'll come on to later. Um, but before we do that, Paul is going to take us through some of the um, basic requirements of PROTECT. Go to the next slide, please, Andrew. Thank you. So PROTECT is basically going to require the duty holders to do three things. Firstly, to assess the risk of terror attacks. Secondly, to consider, as far as reasonably practical, measures to mitigate that risk. And then thirdly, to prepare a plan to implement those measures. If we can have the next slide, please, Andrew. I'll move on to who are the duty holders under PROTECT. And I think this is an area that we can expect will develop with the draft legislation as it makes its way through Parliament. Provisionally, we're expecting that the, the, the duty holders will be the owners and occupiers of the public accessible locations, prospectively others who hold some responsibility for those locations, such as private security provisions or license holders. Um, and then separately, the inquiry has looked carefully at the issue around grey spaces. Grey spaces are areas of public space that might be occupied by multiple businesses, um, and that included the city room in the context of the Manchester Arena attack. The recommendations of Sir John Saunders look at positively obligating those businesses who occupy shared spaces to work together to implement the protect duty. Can you have the next slide, please, Andrew? So where will the duty apply? Well, um, the consultation is quite straightforward in that respect. It's engaged where a publicly accessible venue has capacity in excess of 100. But it will also apply to workplaces where there are more than 250 employees who also receive visits from members of the public. Um, perhaps the most common example I can think of uh, where the duty will be engaged is civic buildings who have large numbers of staff working inside but have over-the-counter facilities, for example. Uh, there'll be a number of other obvious examples in retail and hospitality sectors as well. 
we have visited the duty is going to engage other public spaces and we can't exclude further categories. The consultation took a very simplistic approach in terms of duty holders, looking at small, medium and large publicly accessible locations. But um, as evidenced by the words of Sir John Saunders, when he looked specifically at, at, at venues like the Manchester Arena, um, we think that it's possible that the legislation may take a slightly different approach and distinguish um, locations by capacity um, and, and size. There are going to be very limited exemptions um, in relation to the duty. Transport hubs are the most obvious exemption, whether that's marine, rail, bus, and that's because they're caught by existing legislation. Similarly, some sports stadia are caught by uh, the Taylor reforms um, and will also be exempt. Uh, other than that, every other venue is likely to be caught, provided it meets the capacity requirements. So I'll hand over to Rose now, who's going to look at compliance and enforcement. Thanks. Um, so I think this is one of the key outstanding questions, really, um, and it's whether or not there's going to be an inspection enforcement regime, and if so, what form will it take? And interestingly, in response to the government consultation, the respondents were divided as to whether there should even be an inspection and enforcement regime. Um, but I think there are some really compelling arguments for it. Um, so firstly, as I've previously said, the voluntary schemes um, that have been utilised previously have been unsuccessful. Um, but I think another key point is that an inspection and enforcement regime will ensure that businesses don't become complacent about their approach to terrorism. And that's something that the chairman has emphasised throughout the inquiry. Another point is that the government consultation has um, highlighted that there'll be a period of bedding in and education before any enforcement comes into play. And it's likely that an inspectorate will be able to help organisations identify areas for improvement or vulnerability and also share advice and best practice. And of course, an inspectorate is likely to further the aim of protecting the public, which is the whole point of protect. Um, so moving on then to what form any compliance regime may take. Well, the government consultation has currently suggested a light touch regime, potentially something to what we see um, in licensing, licensing regulation at the moment with the power to enforce civil penalties. Now, what the chairman says about this is that while a light touch regime might be appropriate for smaller organisations, for large organisations, there needs to be a much more robust regime comparative to what we see in health and safety and food safety legislation. Um, and I've included a quote on the next slide um, from the volume one report, which really highlights the chairman's reasoning for this. And what he says is that there's no good reason to put in place an enforcement regime that's any less rigorous or robust in terms of inspection, enforcement and penalty than that which exists, which exists in parallel health and safety legislation. And he goes on to explain why by saying that what's at stake is the um, lives of people going about their everyday business. And I think that really makes a very compelling case for a dedicated inspectorate um, akin to the health and safety executive. Um, Moving on, he takes a very similar approach to enforcement. Um, and what he says about that is that it's important that there's proper enforcement of PROTECT because the possible consequences of breach are so serious um, that proper steps need to be taken to avoid them happening. And much like inspection, he thinks that enforcement should be at least as robust and rigorous as comparable regulatory regimes. And I think that really ties in to what the chairman has said throughout the inquiry about complacency because in reality, enforcement is likely to be the um, most important deterrent um, in avoiding non-compliance. So looking then at what the um, chairman specifically recommends in relation to enforcement and the potential ramifications for duty holders. So I thought was quite interesting about the volume one report is that he sets out that he thinks there should be a mechanism for issuing formal notices. So in particular, he thinks that inspectorate should have the power to issue a notice which sets out remedial actions with a timescale for compliance and also notices which can prevent businesses from operating until remedial action is taken. And for those of you who um, are involved in health and safety law, that sounds a lot like improvement and prohibition notices. He sets out um, that he thinks there should be an appeal process for notices that are believed to be invalid. And he also thinks that there should be a criminal offence for failure to comply with a valid notice without reasonable excuse. Um, another final point that I want to talk about in relation to compliance um, is likely to be um, the most troubling to organisations, and that is the fact that he thinks um, 
consideration should be given to criminal prosecutions for failure to adhere to protect. Um, so what does that mean in terms of penalties? Well, what the chairman has described throughout his report sounds very similar to um, the kind of regulation we see in health and safety. And if we assume that a similar sentencing guideline is adopted to that which we see in health and safety, that could potentially have very serious consequences for non-compliance, potentially extremely large fines and custodial sentences based on the size of the business and their turnover. And I think that's a particular risk when you consider the uh, large numbers of people that a potential terrorist attack puts at risk of serious harm. Um, and now to wrap up on Protect, Paul is going to talk us through the possible implications for civil liability. Thanks, Rose. Um, it's unclear whether this is an intended or unintended consequence of Protect, but it seems to us that given that it imposes a duty which requires positive steps to be taken, a risk assessment, measures to be implemented, then in the event of future terror attacks, if an organisation has failed to comply with its duties under Protect, that liability may well attach in a civil context. Of course, that represents a radical change in the law from where it sits currently. Um, now, we won't know until we see the draft legislation itself whether it's intended to confer a direct cause of action. But of course, even if it doesn't um, confer a direct cause of action, a failure to comply with the duty will be, at the very least, evidence of negligence. Um, and Andrew and Laura, I welcome your thoughts on that. It's a, it's a potentially tricky area. We'll have to see what the legislation says. Not really, you? <laughs> no, you've got some we agree. <laughs> <laughs> well, that wraps up the presentation from our perspective, and we're happy to answer any questions that may have come through on the chat. I'll just check the chat. No, I'm not seeing no questions. any questions. Um, anybody has one now is the time. Well, in which case, um, thank you very much for joining us. Um, thank you very much, um, Paul and Rose, for that really interesting summary of the protect duty and what um, may happen to it, what's likely to contain. And um, we'll end it. We'll end it here. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.